Greetings! I'm Dr. Jason Ozuko from the Psychology Department at SUNY Geneseo, and welcome to the next video in our online PsychoPi series. Today we're going to be building our first full experiment, and it will be a Stroop experiment. So, I have PsychoPi opened up here, and I have the default experiment that you begin with. I've simply saved it as a Stroop experiment in a new folder. Now, as you recall from our prior videos, we're going to be adding routines into the timeline here, and we can actually fill out the uh, routines now. Uh, we want to have a welcome screen. Uh, we want to have a series of trials. I'm going to rename this as Stroop Trial. And we want to have a goodbye screen. And our experiment is really not going to be too much more complicated than that. For our Stroop Trial, we will uh, have this trial occur within a loop, and I will deal with the parameters of this loop in a moment, but for right now, we'll call it the uh, Stroop Trials. And I also would like there to be a 500 millisecond gap after the end of our Stroop Trial. So I'm going to insert a new routine called blank 500, and I will insert it in the loop. And I'd actually also, just for aesthetic purposes, like this blank to occur after the welcome screen, so that after subjects see the welcome message when they press spacebar to begin the experiment, they don't immediately get the first stimulus right in their face. There's a brief prepar uh, preparation period before the first stimulus actually appears. So you could use this segment as a bit of a review from what you remember from our initial videos. For our welcome screen, our goodbye screen, and our street trial, we want to add text and keyboard objects. I'm going to go ahead and add these in here real quickly. I'll have my welcome uh, message. And I will say, welcome to the experiment. Press spacebar to begin. This message will appear for an infinite duration. And I will add a welcome key of space to allow subjects to uh, begin the experiment. For the goodbye screen, I will similarly have a goodbye message that says, thanks for participating. One trick for goodbye screens or end screens is that you can add a keyboard object for the end screen to end. And, you know, I recommend doing so. But I also recommend putting these on a timer because I can't tell you how many times I've run experiments in the lab myself. And a subject finishes the experiment, they come out, you debrief them, you give them their credit, they leave the lab, and they're your last subject for the day, and you turn off all the lights and walk away, and you come in the next day, and you have an experiment that's still sitting on the goodbye screen, and nobody actually stopped the experiment. Having that happen is bad for a variety of reasons. I mean, first of all, your experiment shouldn't be running for that long. It could crash, or something weird could happen. Um, but you want you want your experiment to actually end just so you can have peace of mind that your data was all logged and closed off properly. So I like to add a little uh, timer to the end of my goodbye screen. You can give it 20 seconds or 10 seconds or however long you'd like. Um, and then we'll have a goodbye key as well. So subjects can press spacebar if they'd like to end the experiment. But put that on a timer. And then that way, if you ever forget... You know, your subject walks out of the experimental room and you ever forget to go in and actually stop the experiment. The experiment will end of its own accord and all your data will be finalized. So um, we will also add in here our blank 500 text of 0.5 seconds. And there we go. All right, the bones of our experiment are there. Now we have to work on uh, the actual trial itself. So for those of you unfamiliar with uh, a Stroop experiment, in a Stroop experiment, you see words like red, green, and blue, and those words appear in ink colors like red, green, or blue. So you could see the word red in red ink or the word red in blue ink. Subjects are tasked with responding to the color of the ink, but not the word. So if you see red in red ink, you're supposed to say red, but if you see red in blue ink, you're supposed to say blue. And this is a difficult task to do, especially under speed. And we can look at the response times of subjects to see how big of an interference or facilitative effect the uh, words themselves are producing to naming the ink colors. So for our experiment here, we're going to need to create an Excel sheet. And I will call this Stroop underscore stimuli. Remember not to use spaces in file names. Okay, for our new Excel sheet, I'm going to have a word 
and color. And under Word, I will be showing subjects red, blue, green, and yellow. And under color, I'm going to have the colors red, blue, green, and yellow. And I will simply save my sheet as so. Now, going into my Stroop trial itself, on the trial, I want to show um, the Stroop word. And so I'm going to use the variable word from my Excel sheet. And remember to set this to set every repeat. If you have it set at constant, uh, PsychoPy will try and find the variable word at the very beginning of your experiment, but word doesn't show up until we start loading in this Excel sheet, which doesn't happen until this point of the timeline. So set every repeat. And in terms of appearance, I want the actual appearance of my uh, word itself to use the color in the uh, color column. So I will select a color. And no, I haven't misspelled color. I'm simply Canadian. And that's how we spell color in Canada. From here in my loop, I'm going to select my Stroop Stimuli Excel sheet. Notice it detects that there are four conditions, one, two, three, four, and there are two parameters, one and two. I'm going to have number of repetitions at one. I will have random selection. We will leave the rest as is, and let's just see what happens when we run our experiment uh, for the first time. Um, actually, our experiment crashed, and that was uh, a mistake on my part. This is a good lesson in how to read uh, errors. So when your experiment crashes, go to your PsychoPy runner and look to see what it says. Um, so here we're getting a warning. The warnings usually aren't uh, going to be, cause your experiment to crash, but here we have an error. Trace back, most recent call last. Uh, it's telling us that there's a problem in this uh, Python file, which is our Stroop experiment. Right, that's the name of our experiment. It's saying line 110, and it's saying that color is not defined. So there's a problem with that color variable. Uh, if we go in to the appearance that we just set up, Notice that I forgot to change this from constant to set every repeat. And so that's the kind of error you will get if you make that mistake. Easy mistake to make. Even the best of us can make these little mistakes. That's okay though. Catch your error and run your experiment after you fixed your error and everything should be fine. There we go. Welcome to the experiment. And now we have some words. Notice that my words are appearing in the text color that I gave to them. So thanks for participating. There is my very simple experiment. Now note that we had two variables here and they were randomized. They were set to randomize. We go into our loop. Things were set to random. However, when PsychoPy randomizes things, it randomizes the entire row together. So it randomized red in red ink, blue in blue ink, green in green ink, yellow in yellow ink. So in our experiment here, we actually wanted red to sometimes appear in red ink, but sometimes blue, green, or yellow. And the result of what we got when we randomized things is that these two values always stayed together. And these two values always stayed together. And these two values always stayed together. Um, oh, you might occasionally get this message when you're uh, running your experiment. You just say yes to this. What's happening is over in your code review, your experiment's code is actually being updated because you compiled and ran your experiment. And so as long as your code is open in the coder, you will occasionally periodically get that message asking you to, you want to update the code in your coder with a change that occurred on your hard drive. So you just say yes to that. But anyway, as we were discussing, your variables will randomize together and so they will stay locked together. This is important to understand about uh, the PsychoPy uh, loops. Now there is a way to shuffle your columns separately and we will look at that um, later on. But we're gonna start with the simple case of we just wanna keep things very basic. We don't wanna get into coding just yet. And so what can we do to uncouple our two columns? Well, how about this? What if we simply added some more rows? So maybe we'll have red in blue ink, blue in yellow ink, uh, green in red ink, and yellow in green ink. So there, now we have some trials where the word and the color do not match. We'll save our Excel sheet, come in here, 
we'll reload our Excel sheet and notice now it detects eight conditions. And so now when we run our experiment, we will, instead of getting four trials, we will get eight trials. And we will be able to see that the items are in sometimes incorrect colors. So here's yellow and yellow ink. Here's red and blue ink. And so on. Now, one of our next steps to our experiment is to add some kind of response that subjects can make. Uh, for instance, uh, we could add a keyboard or a microphone response. Now, if you would like to add a microphone response, being that this is a Stroop experiment, that would make sense. You can name your microphone, microphone uh, group. You can give it a timeout. Let's change the entire trial to two seconds. And from here, if you were to run your experiment, it would show the words, you would be able to speak, and what would happen is in your data folder, you not only would get a data sheet, but you would get a subfolder for each subject containing the sound files from uh, their responses. Now, you would have to code those sound files. In the newest version of PsychoPy, there is a way to uh, transcode uh, the responses using Google Voice, I believe, but it only works locally and not online. So for our purposes, we're going to keep it a little simpler, and we're going to go with a keyboard response. We'll call this E group, and the response can be red, green, blue, or yellow. So I'm just picking the uh, letters. And I will have this last for two seconds. And I will cause this to end the routine when subjects press a button. Now, I also keep in mind I'm using the lowercase letters. If you were to put an uppercase R um, or an uppercase G, let's say, uh, then subjects would actually have to hold shift and press the letter. And that's not actually what you want. So by default, when you're putting letters in as your keyboard responses, make sure that they're uh, lowercase. And for right now, let's just give that a run and see how the experiment looks. So welcome to the experiment. R, R, Y, G, B, almost said R, B, uh, G, and Y. There we go. We responded to our Stroop experiment. Now, if we go and look into our data, we haven't looked at our data too much in this series yet. But if you open your data folder, you will find a separate data file for each, uh, each time you've run your experiment. Now, normally, these files would begin with the subject number. I haven't been putting in subject numbers. I'll start putting them in so you can see. But I have this folder sorted by date modified. So the most recent file um, is the one from the run that we just did. So when you uh, run PsychoPy, you get three uh, log files, essentially. You get a side dat file, a log file, and a CSV file. We're going to be interested in the CSV file. And if we open it up, we get to see what PsychoPy was actually logging in our experiment. So note that PsychoPy on each trial was logging the data from the um, Excel sheet, from our stimulus ex Excel sheet. So we have what word was shown and what color was shown. So we can see that information. So each row in your data file represents a routine. And so in our experiment, oh, in our experiment here, we had a routine, the welcome screen, and then we had a number of routines, which were our trials, and we had a goodbye screen, which was its own routine. So if we were to actually look at all the data that got logged, we would see that we have all of our trials plus one extra routine that was logged, and that was the welcome screen, and one extra routine that was logged at the end, and that was the goodbye screen. So it's only on the second routine of the entire experiment that we start to see stimuli, because that was the first routine of our trials. Note, too, that the names that we gave our routines are getting logged into our data file. So I said in the previous videos, you want to make sure you're naming things so that when you're looking at your data, you know what's what. And this is a prime example of why you want to do that. We know when a space was pressed, the space was pressed on the welcome screen because we named our keyboard object, our keyboard component, the key welcome. Um, we can see that for the 
On the welcome screen, subjects press spacebar. We can also see how long it took them. It took them 1.24 seconds, meaning that uh, this subject only read the welcome screen for a little over a second. Now that was me and I was skipping through, but you can see that you can start to get an idea of how you might scrutinize data to see if subjects were actually, for instance, reading your instruction screens. You can go and look at the reaction times, the RTs, for your various uh, screens and keyboard responses and get a sense of, are subjects actually paying attention? This is especially important if you're running online studies. You might want to look at these uh, reaction times, especially on instruction screens, to see how quickly people were responding. Here are our experimental trials. And if we scroll over, we can similarly see, so here's the word and the color it was shown in uh, on the screen. But then we can see what key did a subject press? And we can see how long it took. So you can get reaction times and responses. And you could now go in and score this for accuracy. And you could look for RTs that are way too long or way too short. You could get average reaction times for the matching or the congruent trials versus the mismatching or the incongruent trials. Um, and so all your data is essentially here. Now, right now, our data isn't actually organized in a tremendously useful fashion. And so uh, we're going to start adding to this experiment to make it easier to actually analyze our data. So one thing that would be nice to track is whether these trials are congruent or incongruent. Right now, we can manually look and see red and red. That's a congruent trial. Green and red, that's an incongruent trial. But it's it would be nice to have a variable that tracked whether this was the case so that we didn't have to manually uh, detect it ourselves. Something else that would be nice to track is whether subjects press the right button. So when subjects pressed R, was R the actual correct response here or was this an error? So let's add those two features into our experiment. I'm not going to save that uh, data file. So the way you can add uh, both of those uh, both of those features is by adding in some new variables into uh, your stimulus sheet. For example, we can have uh, a stimulus type and we can label certain pairings as congruent or incongruent. I'm just going to copy these down. Now this type variable is never going to actually be used to display anything in our experiment. But if you're paying attention in the data file, the data file was logging uh, each row of our stimulus sheet as it was going through the loop. And so by actually adding an extra variable here called congruent, we're going to actually get congruent or incongruent logged into our data file so we can easily see which trials are congruent and which are incongruent. Similarly, we're going to have a correct key column. And here we're going to put in the correct key that we expect subjects to press. And so I want subjects pressing a key that corresponds with their color. Again, this correct key is going to be logged into our data file, but we can go one step further and have PsychoPy actually code whether our responses were right or wrong using this new correct key variable. So going uh, into our loop, we're going to reload our stimulus sheet and now we detect four parameters, type, word, color, and correct key. Now going into my Stroop trial itself, I'm going to edit the keyboard routine and, or the keyboard component. And under the data tab, I'm storing the last key, that's fine. But I actually want to store what the correct answer is. And the correct answer is whatever key happens to be in this column. So I can actually use the correct key uh, variable, which will be loaded every time uh, we go through a cycle in our trials, every time we go through the loop. And for instance, if PsychoPy loads up this trial, it will log congruent blue, blue, B. Then it will show the word blue in blue. And then the keyboard routine will not only get which key subjects press, but it will also compare that key against B. And if subjects press B, it will log one a value of one, and if subject, subjects press any other key, it will log a value of zero, meaning incorrect. So PsychoPy is going to have a new column called correct, and it will be logging ones and zeros for us. So having made those two minor changes, I'm going to rerun the experiment. 
And this time I'm actually going to give myself a participant ID number so you can all see what will happen. Participant number one. And we will go in here. So red, uh, green, yellow, yellow, green. I'm going to make an error here. Red, I'll say, and I'll call this one yellow. And I'll call this one green. So the last three responses were errors on my part. Okay. Now, when we go into our data folder, we can see there's some new files here. Again, I have my folder sorted by uh, date modified, so the recent files always come right to the top. Uh, but if you don't have it sorted that way, uh, just look for the most recent participant number that you actually ran. So you can see this was subject one in Stroop experiment, uh, and then here's the date in which I ran the experiment. Opening the data file here, we can uh, begin to see what was logged. So as I said, we're now logging type. So we can see incongruent and congruent trials easily. We can also see what the correct key was. And now if we go over to where subjects actually responded, here's the key that was pressed. And here is whether that key was accurate. And I said my last three responses were inaccurate. You can see here, five accurate responses, three inaccurate responses. You still get all your good information about reaction time, so you can look at that as well. And this therefore gives you a really nice summary of all your data. Now, one last thing we'll touch on here today is how can you organize this data quickly to get summaries for your subjects? Because especially if you have more trials, it can be cumbersome to go through and you're not gonna have data organized very ni nice and neatly such that you have all the correct and then the incorrect responses and you could uh, tally things up easily yourself. Um, before we actually do that, let's go into our loop though and let's set the number of repetitions to five. And what this is going to do is basically cycle through our Excel sheet, our stimulus Excel sheet five times. So rather than getting eight trials, we're gonna get 40 trials. Uh, so number of repetitions tells PsychoPy how many times to cycle through uh, your loop and your loop's size by default is the size of your Excel sheet. So let, let me go ahead and run this and I'm going to use a different participant ID this time. I'm going to use participant two and I'm going to run this experiment myself and I will catch up with you once I have some data. All right, so I just finished running my experiments and I'm gonna open up my new data sheet. And as you can see, we have a lot more trials now. Um, so my stimulus sheet was repeated um, five times. Now note that in this case, what's happening based on my stimulus sheet is PsychoPy is going through the first eight trials and then it's reshuffling them and doing them again, the next date and the next date. And so what that means is I'm never, or I'm very rarely ever gonna get a red, red trial followed by another red, red trial. It means that we're not at, we don't actually have 40 trials that we're truly randomizing. It means we're continually re-randomizing the same subset of eight. And so our trials are going to be more dispersed across the entire set of 40 trials than they would be if we copied this sheet five times. So another way to do what I just did, rather than using loops in uh, or repetitions in PsychoPy, would be to copy my sheet five times so that I now have 40 trials. Then going into my uh, loops and having number of rep repetitions be one and selecting my stimulus sheet. Now I, want, I still have 40 trials, but these 40 trials will be truly randomized. And so you could potentially get red, 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 all in a row because red, red appears multiple times. So there's different ways you might want to uh, deal with having larger numbers of trials. If you use number of repetitions, it will take whatever you've got, it will run through it to its entirety, and then it will re-randomize and resample that in a new order. So you get a distributed randomization as opposed to if you truly wanted uh, 40 trials that were completely uh, randomized and I need to save this and then I can go ahead and bring that back to eight to five. Um, in any case, it's not going to mess up our data. I just wanted to point that out to you in case you were thinking you wanted to have a large number of trials and how you might want to randomize things. But here is our large data set and I intentionally 
or admittedly some sometimes unintentionally made some errors as I was going through to make sure that we have some variation in our data. Uh, the Stroop task is hard, even if you know how, what it is, it's still hard not to make those errors, which is a true testament to how uh, automated uh, reading really is. But anyway, let's imagine this is data from one of our subjects. What can we do to actually quickly tally things up and get a better sense of our data? Um, and actually, one more thing I'll point out just before we get to that. Um, we do have some nice counters also built into our PsychoPy sheet. So we know which trial number we're at in our loop. You can see it counts from 0 to 39. Computers begin counting at 0. It's just how they work. This is actually 40 trials, though, because uh, you have 1 to 39 plus 1 more, which is the 0. Um, you can also see which stimulus this was from your sheet. So here are the eight stimuli. The so stimulus zero is red, red. Uh, stimulus one is blue, blue. Two is green, green. Okay, so that's stimulus zero, red, red. One, blue, blue. Three, green, green. So PsychoPy not only tracks what tr uh, trial you're on in the loop, but also uh, where this stimulus came from your stimulus sheet, which is quite nice. Uh, it helps for debugging later on if you need to look things up. You can also see what repetition you're at in the loop. So you can see the first repetition. Again, computers start counting at zero. So it's the first, then the second, the third, uh, and the fourth, and eventually the fifth repetition. And so, you know, a lot of these numbers, you, you know, if you open up this data sheet without watching this video, you might have just glossed over a lot of this and thought, I don't know what any of this means. But if you take a minute to kind of look at the, the headings, you know, uh, things are actually not too difficult to decode. And there's some good information being logged here in your data file. You might not need to look at it 90% of the time, but it's there. Okay, back to the task at hand. How do we actually summarize this data easily? Well, there's a number of things you could do. Um, you could export the CSV data into your software of choice, like R or uh, you know any other uh, statistical package that you'd like. You could write your own scripts to sort out the data. One thing that I like to do, because the data typically opens in Excel, is just use something called pivot tables because I think it's a fast and easy way to summarize your data. So I'm actually going to save this file as, and I'm going to save it as an Excel workbook. And the reason I'm doing this is because if you work with a CSV file and you um, make a pivot table and you save it, later on when you go to open your pivot table, all that stuff will be gone because CSV files are literally just text files with commas separating important values. So if you actually do want to do anything in Excel, it's important uh, that you uh, that you save things as an Excel workbook. Now, in my new sheet that I've created down here, um, and if you didn't catch that, I was over here and I just clicked on the uh, Insert Worksheet button and that created a new sheet. Um, but here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to insert uh, a pivot table. And what a pivot table is, is it's a table that takes uh, a, raw, a raw table and allows you to summarize it or essentially pivot the data. So uh, the source, in terms of my table range, it says select a table or range, I actually want all of this data. I want this raw data table as my input data. And the way you select it is by clicking on the A column and highlighting and dragging over until you've gotten all the named columns. Don't add the blank columns. You'll get errors because uh, the pivot tables don't want blank. So just stop when you get to the end of your uh, table. And then you can just click OK. Now note that your pivot table has detected all the headings from your table. So we had in our table type, word, color, correct, trials, et cetera. And you can see all those are now essentially showing up as potential variables that we can use in our pivot table here. Uh, the first thing I'm going to do is grab the participant ID and put it in as my rows. So drag it into the rows area. And this will just ensure, you know, later on in some of the later videos, we'll look at how to create pivot tables with multiple subjects. And this will ensure that each subject gets their own row. Um, one thing that is being detected here, you can see, it's detecting that we actually have two subjects, subject two, which was me, and blank, 
meaning it's detecting that some of these trial or some of these rows down here, um, it's picking up, but there's actually nothing there. Um, you can turn off uh, particular values in a pivot table by clicking uh, into, for in this case, the row labels area and just unselecting values that you don't want. This ultimately becomes very handy if you need to exclude subjects. If you're doing a pivot table that includes multiple subjects and you think, oh, subject 11, didn't pay attention to the instructions, I want to drop them from the data analysis. You can just click in here, find subject 11 and uncheck them. And that's an easy way to uh, exclude certain subjects for whatever reason. So let's look at both my reaction time and my accuracy. And both are very easy to do. So first of all, I want the reaction time for the uh, Stroop trials. And so I had my key Stroop object, my Stroop, key Stroop component, and that was logging the reaction time um, of my key presses. So I have a se separate reaction time for each uh, trial. Well, I can simply, in my pivot table here, select key Stroop, Stroop reaction time and put that into the values field. And w what it's doing right now is counting up the number of numbers that exist in that column. And I engaged in 40 trials, so this number should be 40. If it was anything other than 40, I would know that I have a mistake. And this would actually allow me to go and look at my data and say, what happened? Did the experiment crash before all 40 trials completed? So this allows you to uh, make sure that your uh, data came out correctly. However, I don't actually want the count. So now that I, I see that there were 40 responses, I can actually click into the properties of that value and change those. And I'm going to change them to an average. You see you, see you can do various other things. You can do products, maxes, minimums, sums. Typically, it's average and count, which are the two that you care the most about. And I can now see that on average, uh, I was responding in about 0.98 0.985 seconds to every trial. So we now have a summary or an average of this column. However, that average isn't too useful because what I would really like is a separate average for the congruent and the incongruent trials. And you can accomplish that very easily because the type column contains labels congruent and incongruent. So why don't I split my data into separate columns based on the type variable? So if I do that, then you can see that uh, psycho that uh, Excel has detected that within the type variable, there are congruent and incongruent trials. And then what it's done is it's still calculating the average of the, the key Stroop reaction time, but it's separating those average based on congruent and incongruent trials. And you can see once again, blank is being detected. I can now click on column labels and uncheck blank to get rid of that if I don't want that. And so now we can see for subject two, which was me, um, I responded in about 0.88 seconds to congruent trials and 1.08 seconds to incongruent trials. That's great. Now let's say that I want to look at accuracy. Well, what I can do is create a, sep a second pivot table. And what I've done is copied my first pivot table because I just want to make a single change. I want to take out the reaction time and I want to put in the uh, correct variable. So the correct variable here, key Stroop correct, was logging a one or a zero. One when I was correct, zero when I was incorrect. And what I can do is drag that variable into my values. Notice that it begins with counts and it's counting 20 congruent and 20 incongruent trials, just as there should be, so that's nice. But I'm going to change this to an average. And now I can see that on congruent trials, I was 100% accurate. On incongruent trials, though, I was only 65% accurate. So now we've quickly summarized the data. And I want to show you one more neat thing you can do with these pivot tables. I'm going to copy my reaction time uh, table over once again, so I can work with a copy of it. And rather than just looking at all congruent and incongruent trials, what if I only want to look at the accurate uh, congruent or incongruent trials. Well, I can grab the uh, correct response and add it as a filter to my table. And I can, for instance, only look at uh, accurate responses. And I can see that 
when we filter our data, so we're only calculating reaction times for congruent and incongruent trials, when the response was correct, I can see that I have, uh, you know, for congruent trials, they were all accurate, so 0.885 seconds. That's how long it, it took to respond normally. Uh, but for incongruent trials, the number changes. So for incongruent trials, it took 1.08 seconds to respond for all incongruent trials but only 65% of them were accurate. So if we only look at that 65%, we can see the accurate incongruent trials were a little slower even. It was, was 1.11 seconds, not 1.08. We could also switch this filter to only look at inaccurate trials. And notice the congruent trials disappear because there are no inaccurate congruent trials. So it's only the incongruent trials that, are, that were inaccurate and that appear in our table. And one last thing we could do is rather than having keystroop correct as a filter, we could simply add it itself as a column. And then we can see that now we have two column variables and we are first showing the inaccurate uh, responses. And there, there were only incongruent trials. And then we are showing the accurate responses. And there we have congruent and incongruent trials. And so we can get now the three separate RTs all in one uh, table. So pivot tables are a handy way to summarize your data. I use them a lot when I get the raw PsychoPy data to just get some summaries, and then I will copy this into uh, my statistical analysis package. But, you know, the data comes out in CSV files. If you're handy with R, you could easily use R or some other package. Anyway, that wraps up our look at how to create a basic experiment. There is a supplementary advanced topics video that follows this video. And that will cover how to get more sophisticated with your shuffling of your stimuli. And especially, how do you do things like randomly shuffle the words and the colors separately? So in our sheet, red and red were always linked. Blue and blue were always linked. Red always appeared in blue if it was an incongruent trial. But how do we shuffle this so that red could appear in one of the other random colors? In order to do this, we're going to have to introduce some scripting and so the advanced uh, topics video is going to cover how do you actually uh, use scripts in order to arrange lists of stimuli in a more sophisticated way. So as far as today goes, thanks for watching. If you haven't subscribed to the channel already, please make sure to do so. And if you are in need of some specific PsychoPy help, I offer both consulting and programming services, the details of which are in the description of this video below. Don't hesitate to reach out if you do need such help. Thanks again for watching and catch you in the next one.